The Hornets sign a surprising player to their final two-way contract. I'll tell you all about him. Plus, we play a game of Stangin' or Clangin' Summer League Edition. That's all today on the Locked On Hornets podcast and this. In all of these games? He played all of them? You sure? You are Locked On Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in. This is Locked On Hornets, and we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time? Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA. All one word, Locked On NBA, for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Thank you so much for making Locked On Hornets your first listen. Every day we are free. We are daily wherever you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube, where for the first time in uh, a week, well, I was on last week, but it was a pre-tape. So for the first time, you were seeing me fresh-faced post-vacation. I'm Doug Branson. You can follow my work on everyhornetsboxscore.com. Going solo here late on a Monday. Wanted to get an episode out for you. I wanted to give Walker some time off because he did uh, a lot of work for me, and he's going to have to do it again (laughs) because I'm taking another vacation. FYI, Walker, breaking news. I'm taking another vacation after this week. I haven't cleared it with him yet, uh, but hopefully he doesn't watch this episode, so I have some time to break the news. Speaking of breaking news, uh, we've got some here. I'm glad I waited a little bit to uh, put this episode together because it gave Woj enough time to drop some news for me the Hornets adding Musa Diabate to their final two-way deal. If you remember, they signed, they had Leaky Black on a two-way deal. It looks like uh, that will continue, at least for the time being. They've got KJ Simpson, their second-round pick, who we did not see in Summer League uh, yet because of an injury. They've got him on a two-way deal. And now for their final of three two-way deals, they have added Musa Diabate, the 6'11", 210-pound center who uh, went to Michigan, played two years, drafted 43rd overall by the Clippers, played two seasons there um, out of Michigan. Uh, This will be his third year in the league. He played 22 games for the Clippers in his rookie season, 11 games in his sophomore campaign. Didn't do a ton in the big show, but in the G League, averaged 16.7 points per game, 11.8 rebounds per game, 1.3 blocks, 1.3 steals, and uh, shot 56.9% from the field. He also was featured for the Clippers Summer League team where he scored uh, 12.2 points and 7.4 rebounds um, in five contests in Las Vegas. Uh, Born in France, so assume that Musa speaks the native tongue and uh, can uh, be a a friend to, or might might already know, be familiar with Tijan Salon, the rookie out of France. Uh, So that's a little added bonus there. But the question is, is this a surprise that the Charlotte Hornets went outside of their own organization? Because remember, we saw some nice things from Mo Gee in one game in the California Classic before he hurt his ankle in the second game. And we unfortunately didn't see anything from him in in the next uh, six games, uh, seven games, actually. So uh, they had that. And then Jake Stevens played a lot for them, as well as James Banks, Played a lot for them in Summer League, but they didn't go with any of those guys. They decided to go to the Clippers and uh, steal away Musa Diabate. Is that a surprise? I would say no for the aforementioned reason that Mo Gee did impress in that game one, but didn't get back because of the ankle injury. They didn't have a lot of time to look at him. I think if they did have that time and Mo Gee played well, Mo Gee may very well have been on the two-way contract. Jake Stevens... Did some nice things, shot it well from three at times, but was just too slow, too unathletic, I think, to be attractive to what the Hornets are trying to put together, which are guys that can run because this team is going to be fast-paced. So you're going to need a guy who can get up and down the floor quickly. That was not Jake Stevens. He can block shots. He can fill the middle, but you got to play him in a ton of drop coverage. You are not going to switch that guy at all. Diabate. Um, is, you know, at 6'11", 210, like, he he is certainly, relative to Jake Stevens, way more athletic. Um, But, you know, is is going to fit that mold, I think, a little bit better. And uh, is going to allow the Hornets to add another piece that is uh, physical, 
I, I'm sure, look, if they are adding him, he's got to have a great work ethic. He's he's going to work hard. He's going to put in the effort. I mean, that's that's the kind of guys they're targeting. If he doesn't end up being that player, uh, that would be surprising to me because that just seems like the kind of attitude they're looking for. Um, and he's fighting and he's grinding and he's continuing to put up good numbers outside of his limited time um, in the NBA. So what does he add? He adds uh, size. He adds physicality underneath uh, a game that, you know, is less athletic, less speedy than Nick Richards, but does provide a little, probably a little bit more physicality than Nick Richards if you're contrasting the two players. And you're talking about a guy on a two-way contract. So it's somebody that's going to provide depth for you in in case of, of an injury. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't need to be better than Nick Richards, but does complement some things there. Uh, what doesn't he add, though? He's not he's not a shooting big. I mean, just I, I think he's taken maybe a couple of attempts in his time in the NBA and in the G League, too. So that's disappointing to me because I saw a guy in Mo Gee who was who was sending him up. I saw a guy in Jake Stevens who was never afraid to send up a three when, whenever he got the opportunity. And that was exciting to me because so far, Mark Williams has not shown that ability. Limited time to see him. And Nick Richards, I thought he was hiding it under a bushel. I was wrong on that. So I am desperately waiting for the Hornets to sign a big, a center, not a power forward, a legit center with size that, that can toss him up. In fairness, even though the game is trending that way, it's it's still a bit of a rarity. I mean, those guys are valuable for a reason. But to have two guys in the system in Summer League and neither of those guys make the two-way, that's a bit disappointing to me. I should note, though, two-way contracts are non-guaranteed. So Stevens, even Mogee, could get an Exhibit 10 contract, join the Hornets in training camp, outperform Diabate, and then Diabate, they say Dia bye bye, and you know hello Mo. You never know. Okay, I just accidentally rhymed there twice. This is what you get when you get a solo Doug show. So that's the situation that we have with Musa Diabate. I, I think it makes sense in a lot of ways, and in some ways I'm disappointed. Although again, if you view this as as one of maybe two transitional years for the Charlotte Hornets, then then I think you you know you're probably prioritizing, the, uh, particularly at the center position, size, physicality, over the immediate need of a shooting big, and Charles Lee in radio interviews and TV interviews seems to be higher on the idea of Mark Williams shooting three point shots, because if Mark Williams comes in and shows an ability to knock down you know, a three-pointer every once in a while. Not every game, but every once in a while. That that changes the entire calculus, both of what the Hornets can do offensively and and the depth that they have at center. Then the, the Abate ad makes a lot more sense. I am I am strengthened. I am encouraged by the idea that the Hornets are taking the center position seriously. Even if Diabate doesn't end up being the ultimate answer, they've had two guys in summer league, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw in three because I think James Banks did some fun stuff too. Three guys in summer league that were, in my mind, miles ahead of players that they've had the past couple of seasons at the center position that I didn't think had any business being a part of an NBA center rotation. And I don't know yet if Diabate fits that bill. We got to see him. I think, you know, this news hit today. Walker and I will have some opportunity to look over the game tape, and Walker will rejoin me tomorrow. Um, and we'll talk about that some more. Um, but encouraging that the organization is at least taking this position seriously and adding, adding some depth um, that is exciting. I mean, in the little bit that I have watched Diabate play in G League and and a little bit that I got to watch before coming on here in Summer League, he looks like he knows what he's doing. You know, I mean, he looks like he, he can hang on an NBA floor. You wouldn't want to play him for a ton of minutes. He's not going to give you a lot. But it looks like he can hang. And we'll see. He'll have that opportunity to continue to prove that. And he's got some time here to improve his game, as everyone does. Uh, and speaking of those improvements, coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. 
We're going to play Stangin' or Clangin'. It's a Summer League edition. Summer League, all about improvements. And we saw some good things, some Stangin' things, and we saw some Clangin' things, some things that some players are going to have to definitely take back into the lab and figure out. Uh, That's coming up here on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. GameTime is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the GameTime app actually go down closer to the first pitch. I like that. I like when prices go down. Uh, You can get priority last-minute deals, save up to 60% off buying last-minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. You can get flash deals, save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats, ahead of the game or event all in pricing you can toggle the little feature click click toggle and it shows you the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout here's why i love that because i just went on vacation i'm about to go on another vacation don't tell walker yet i've got to tell him first and what i don't like about some other apps that i won't name here is that you go through the whole process you think you're getting a deal and then you get to the end and it's like no there's all these and all of a sudden you're paying a lot of money that's not what happens with game time. Game time, with when you toggle that on, it gives you the prices up front so you know what you're paying. Plus, game time ticket coverage, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticket industry. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NBA. All one word, locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NBA. L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. We're locked on Hornets ahead. Okay, staying in a clanging time, guys. You know the rules. If it's good, it's staying. If it's bad, it's clanging. It's pretty easy. I think the name is self explanatory. People sometimes get tripped up in the name. I don't understand it. Staying. It's great. Clanging. It's not great. So we're going to start with the good. Staying. And I want to start with the rookie because that's where all the eyeballs are. It was delayed because he didn't play in the California Classic. That was clanging. Would have loved to see him there, but understand knee laceration. Didn't play as much as we had liked uh, in the, as much as I would have liked to see him play in Vegas. Uh, that's another clanging. That's two clangings. I said I was going to start off with the stanging. Here we go. Stanging. Tijon Salon, rookie. His motor is incredible. I mean, when you watch him play, as soon as he gets on, he's a little jackrabbit out there. He wants he wants the basketball. He wants to score. He wants to do good things for his team. He runs hard every possession. He's all over the place, moving his feet. And when he hit that three point shot, his first three pointer of summer league, he gave a little Tiger Woods fist pump. I mean, the intensity is there. And look, a lot of things have to fall into place for Tijon Salon to be, you know, I've, I've said echoes of freakiness, Giannis, 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 Giannis. A lot of things have to fall into place for that to happen. But if you as a player don't have that foundation of wanting to get better every single day and fight through everything that you've got to fight through, whether it be injuries, whether it be bad games, whether it be just the intensity of, making yourself better every single day, waking up, getting into the gym, doing the things, taking care of your body, all of those things. If you don't have that something special inside of you, then you're just you're not going to make it, particularly as a project in the NBA. A lot of struggles lie ahead for Tijon Salon. What we saw on the court, I think, is an indicator of what this organization saw in him when they drafted him sixth overall. They bought into the man. They, they're, they're going to get an opportunity to develop the game but Charlotte bought into the man, and the man looks exciting. All right, Tijon Salon, another stang for him. His awareness in transition off ball. I'm going to make that distinction. That's a little tease about what's coming up in the clanging section. But his awareness in transition on both sides, on defense, um, he did a good job, I think, of filling, you know, filling the lane, making sure he was in a position to either make a play or, or cut off a play. And I thought his awareness and transition on the defense, defensive end was good, and he ran back hard every time, which is not something that all Charlotte Hornets have done recently in, on defense. It's been a problem. So seeing Tijon do that, I think, uh, should indicate that that won't be a problem for him getting minutes in a Charles Lee defensive-focused organization coming up. Offensively, you know, again, takes huge Giannis-like strides in transition, 
catches the basketball, makes a quick move, and is able to get in and finish through contact. Like he he generated a lot of and ones in summer league, and most of those and ones were on uh, off ball transition opportunities. So he looked good there. Final staying, and I'm going to go through these quickly because I got a lot. And and I know you know summer league's been over for a while, but I've been on vacation for a week, and I wanted to get my thoughts. Just dump them all here before we transition to uh, the silly season. Final staying in for T. John Salon, ISO defense. So some question marks about the other end of his defense, but ISO, when he got an opportunity one-on-one with a player, even if that player was smaller, even if that player was slightly quicker, he was able, with the shot clock winding down, to move his feet enough to bother an offensive player enough to force a bad shot. Did that a couple of times in the mid-range. Now, if I'm being realistic, when you know that player turns from a summer league player to even like a bench player in the NBA, will he be able to continue to do that? Uh, I don't know. You know, I think that's between now and training camp and through training camp and preseason, the answer to that question is probably going to be the same answer to the question of how significant a role does T. John Salon have in this lineup in like the first half of the season when the Hornets are still you know, in, in content contention mode. All right, moving on from the rookie, Nick Smith Jr. His leadership, I thought, was excellent. His attitude coming into camp for California Classic and all through Summer League, his attitude was great. His defensive give a bleep uh, was, was good, and it's been good really his entire career. It's just that, like, his focus on the defensive end, his continued effort on the defensive end, even as his offense struggled, you know, that's when you have to give him a gold star. And we'll get to the clanging, which I think is obvious with Nick Smith Jr., but I just wanted to start off by saying, like, I think Nick Smith Jr. did a lot of things that are going to prove uh, valuable for him as he works his way into this rotation, showing off his ability to do some things that he isn't necessarily, aren't necessarily his calling cards. And if you're, look, I don't think Nick Smith Jr. has shown enough to be like automatic I'm I'm this guy in the rotation and you've got to you've got to play me. I don't think he's he's shown that, okay? And so if you're talking about a guy that needs to define a role, it's great when they can do like multiple things that aren't necessarily their calling card. So I think he did that. Uh, I love the staying in Brandon Miller playing one game. Uh, but staying in from the perspective of Brandon Miller showed up when he didn't have to and set an example, set a precedent for future young players. But I also think that playing one game was one enough, right? I didn't want to see this guy injured. I didn't want to see a freak ankle injury. Like, get in there, you know, get your shots up, get your 23 points, lead the team in scoring, even though you only play one game, and and get the heck out of there, you know? I love that. Um, I think Stangen, biggest Stangen probably of the entire summer league was Charles Lee getting buy-in from all of these guys, not just from Brandon Miller, but Nick Smith Jr. playing defense. Uh, just all across the board, guys that you knew – and then guys that you didn't know, like Matt Morgan and Xavier Simpson and on, on, and down the line, Brandon Slater, getting all these guys to give up the basketball, not make knucklehead plays, play within the system. You know, I, I think that that takes a special kind of coach that you could go in there. I think it takes a championship level coach to go in there and say, all right, you know, I've got this, I've got this cachet. You need to, you know, heed what I say and good things will happen. You know, I think we got a preview of that in, the, in, in his lead up to the California Classic. Changes are happening with his organization. That's a great thing. All right, rapid fire, Stangen. Jeff Peterson finding not one, but two point guards that allowed this team to play functional basketball. Matt Morgan shooting the lights out of the basketball at times. His 36 points off the bench, 11 11 from the field, 7 7 from three in that game five. Oh my God, it was amazing. I don't think we're going to see. I don't think we've seen a Charlotte Hornets Summer League performance like that before. I'm not sure we're ever going to see it again. It was a heater of all heaters in Summer League from a guy that was playing overseas, uh, you know, and it looks like he's going to go back to play overseas. But it was one shiny moment for Matt Morgan. It was a beautiful shiny moment that was followed up by Brandon Slater, also gets a stang in, in my book for his 30 points on 10 of 16 shooting, 6 of 9 from 3 that sort of came out of nowhere in Game 5 in Vegas after really giving the Hornets next to nothing 
and offensively at least in, in the previous games. Um, he just goes nuts in that game five. And I thought Leaky Black's dirty work, you know, defensively taking on some tough assignments. We'll talk about his clanging coming up, but staying in, you know, I thought he did some janitorial work for this summer league team, some stuff that you got to do. Leaky Black was there for that. He still has a two way contract, um, as far as we know. Uh, but back to Jeff Peterson finding the two point guards. Like he constructed a roster that made sense, that looked like from the outset, it looked like it could, it could be competitive. And then under a rock, you were hiding Matt Morgan, you were hiding uh, James Banks. You know, guy, guys you didn't know a ton about came in and they bought into Charles Lee, but you had to find those guys. You had to get those guys on the roster, something that Mitch Kupchak's front office was unable or unwilling to do. And they, they Jeff Peterson finally did it, and I thought it paid dividends for them in summer. Okay, coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We did the good. Now we shifted the bad, the clanging. We'll talk about some things that some guys have to work on, evident in Summer League. That's coming up on the Locked On Hornets podcast. All right, for Stangin', we started with the rookie. For Clangin', we're going to start with the rookie again. Tijon Salon, his shot selection was bad. Uh, a lot of step back threes that were air balls or near air balls. And when he was cutting towards the basket, all of that was good. When he was you know, in ISO, it was bad. And this was not a surprise if you watched the tape. And, and I did, you know, in the post-draft analysis of the salon pick, I tried to sort of make that evident that, like, we are going to see some very interesting shots from Tijon Salon, whether they be in Greensboro or Charlotte. You know, he, he, wants, he wants to make plays for his team. He did it for Cholet Basket, and he had a lot of leash to do so. And there were some shots for Cholet Basket that were just like, well, okay. Um, I mean, if he can hit that shot, he's elite. But he's not hitting it yet. Um, so it had a couple of those where you go, okay, wow. But here's the probably the biggest clanging for Tijon Salon was his awareness and transition on ball. After the first game where he played limited minutes, the team said it was because of the laceration on the knee. I have a I'll believe them. That's fine. I'm not gonna call, I'm not gonna say anybody's being dishonest. But if they also decided to hold back his minutes because they were a little bit worried about like playing him a ton and him losing confidence because the game was a little fast for him, da, 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 like that wouldn't shock me. If if that was just an added benefit to also keeping him healthy. Because, because in that first game when they played him limited minutes, he got opportunities to do all good things because a lot so much of it was off ball. Then as he started to play more and more, more and more became on ball, and he was making good defensive plays in the open floor, getting steals. He's got, you know, crazy long wingspan, these huge hands, and he's able to, you know, knock away passes or whatever. And so he would get steals and and he would just race as fast as he could up the floor with no idea about like, all right, what is the defense giving me? Where are my teammates? Do I have help? Where is that help? Things that when we talk about players with like, you know, high basketball IQ, they, uh, we talk about like basketball instincts, you know, a lot of stuff we talked about with Brandon Miller coming out of that one year in Alabama where it's like, it's it's special when guys have that when they haven't been you, you really don't have to teach it sometimes. Sometimes you can teach it. Sometimes with experience. And we have to remember that Tijon Salon is the youngest player. He was the youngest player in the draft, 18 years old. Like he's got a lot of time to figure all this stuff out. But it's clear when he takes the basketball, races up the floor, no help, and gets swarmed by two or three guys and just absolutely panics and almost turns it over a couple of times, was lucky that the ball bounced off defenders and, and a couple of those possessions went out of bounds. It's like clear, oh, okay, I get it. Like that's, he's a project. Like you're not, you're not giving that guy a significant role immediately because he does things like that. Honestly, like similar things that we saw Kai Jones do but Kai Jones was a little bit older, and he never really adjusted out of that. And so that's what you're watching for for Salon. 
can he mature? Can he adjust? Can he, you know, learn to do different things? Look for help. The game will slow down for him. You saw that with Nick Smith Jr., right? The game slowed down for him significantly from year one in summer league where he looked like that. He was the jackrabbit flying all over the floor with no regard for like how things were developing on the floor, who was where and doing what, right? But then in the second year, as he showed more leadership, even when his shot was not falling, the game was slow enough where he could make, I mean, he made really good plays in, both in transition and pick and roll. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't add that to Stangham, but Nick Smith Jr., Working with bigs in the pick and roll, effectively pot making pocket passes that he just was not capable of making in year one, like that's that's player development. So that's all I'm saying with Salon is that those moments where the wake up call of like, okay, this guy might take a minute. His defensive IQ, same thing. Like that's another clang, and like he was out of position a lot in the half court, pick and roll, you know was a little slow to react, particularly when he was weak side help, a little slow to react to some plays, got cut on in the from the corner a lot. The cool thing is that he has like the athleticism, a little bit of athleticism and, and enough size that he can recover off of those mistakes. Some guys they let the they let the back cut and there's just no chance of them recovering. He not only has the ability, he has the willingness, he did that a few times. So that's nice. But Clang in defensive IQ, like he's going to have to improve significantly in that. And that may just come with mistakes and G League time and, and such, so on and so forth. All right, the big one. The big clanging was Nick Smith Jr. and his shooting. If not for Leaky Black and his 26% from the field on 3.8 field goal attempts per game, Nick Smith Jr. on 13 field goal attempts per game shot just under 33%. Owie. And, and this was a guy that was banger from three in limited opportunities, uh, and he shot just under 31% from three. So it wasn't like oh, I was knocking down his threes, but he was missing layups or blah, blah, blah. And no, it was, I mean, it was everywhere. And he was forcing himself into a lot of tough turnaround two opportunities that probably weren't the best opportunities, but his shooting was off. And the question is, was that a result of him focusing on a lot of other things that the team was asking him to do as part of his summer league assignment? And so that that just threw him completely out of rhythm. Will, will all of that return when he goes back to what is most likely going to be a very similar role that he had on the team last season? Will all of his shooting return in training camp? Maybe they saw it in practice, too, and it just didn't come out in the games. Will it return in training camp into preseason, into the regular season? That's it's going to be a big question mark. Because, look, I mean, we're not talking about a game or two where he was like, oh, I was off. He was really off for a game or two, and that brought his percentages down. No, I mean, he was, uh, he was pretty much off in every single game. He would have some, you know, good starts, and then, you know, shots wouldn't develop. And, um, you know, only 12 points per game. Matt Moore, both both point guards, Matt Morgan and Xavier Simpson, outscored him. Is that, what does that mean, Matt Morgan and Xavier Simpson are better than Nick Smith Jr.? Absolutely not. But would it have been nice if Nick Smith Jr. came out of this summer league with, you know, not god-awful shooting percentages and, you know, somewhere closer to Brandon Miller's 23 points per game? Because Nick Smith Jr. was like your best offensive player outside of Brandon Miller. It's not like you drafted a veteran, uh, a rookie who had played. You know, it's not like they drafted Dalton Connect, who you're like, okay, well, that guy's a scorer. He's got lots of college experience. He's going to kind of take away some of Nick Smith Jr.'s oxygen. Nah. I mean, T. John Salon liked to throw it up, but he wasn't playing a lot. I mean, you're talking about guys like Matt Morgan, Xavier Simpson, Marcus Garrett, Brandon Slater. He took the shots. I mean, had he hit some of them, he probably would have gotten to that, you know, Brandon Miller level. He just didn't didn't knock them down. And I mean, I was complimenting his ability to navigate the pick and roll, and I stand by that. But at the same time, like, I mean, his looking at his assist to turnover percentage right here. So, I mean, three point six a game, three point six assists per game, three point two turnovers per game. So that's not that's not stellar. 
did have 0.8 blo- nearly a block a game. And I will say that's I missed that on the Stangen. But his ability when he was screened to get over top of that screen, recover back and block shots. We saw him do that multiple times in summer league. That's something I've never seen from him in in his rookie season. If I if I saw it, I don't remember it obviously. But that was something good too. So Nick Smith Jr. again, it was it was a mixed bag for him. You would have liked for it to be a little bit more of I think of a positive bag, but it was a mixed bag. It was 50-50. There was some there were some there were as many bad things as good things I think for NSJ NSJ in this one. Uh Brandon Miller just one one quick clanging. He comes in, yeah, his lights out shooting. Like obviously he's going to shoot a lot of threes this season, folks. He hit some of those middies say say goodbye to the middies because he's going to shoot a lot of threes and he was off screens, off ball, catch and shoot. He was doing it all in Vegas. I'm, that's exciting. But his turnovers were less exciting. I'd like to see him become more of a playmaker, and he tried and was turning the basketball over. Some of those were on his own, like dribbling, and you know, dribbling it off his foot or getting or getting trapped because you're obviously the best player on your team, and there's nobody else to distract the defense. They are going to trap you a lot. And he was turning the basketball over and almost cost the Hornets a victory with one of those turnovers. So, you know, for him, it's like I like I love that he played. Um, at times, I think in that game, he played a little unseriously. Now, again, you may say like, well, that's, you know, it's okay. It's summer league, but Charles Lee is telling us that everything matters. And it didn't feel like it, like it a hundred percent mattered to Brandon Miller. It was like, all right, I'm here. I did the practice. I went to team USA. I'm going to get my warm up time in and then see you guys. So, uh, final clanging leaky black disappearing act he gets the final two ways or he gets one of the two-way spots for now but there were times where you go wait leaky bike played in all in all of these games he played all of them you sure because he was just nowhere to be found at certain times and this is a guy that is a is a little bit of a uh, well he's i mean he's a summer league veteran he's played in summer league for the hornets before he's been on a two-way contract and uh, is a carryover, surprising carryover, I think, of of a former regime. And, you know, again, I just read you the scoring percentages. They were not good. Uh, under 30%, 26.3% from the field. Um, he added 3.2 uh, defensive rebounds, 0.8 offensive rebounds. So, yeah, four rebounds per game, 1.6 assists. 1.6 steals, 0.8 blocks. And so there it is, folks. I mean, Leaky Black, I think they're going to ask him to do one thing and one thing only, and that's come in, you know, maybe if he plays at all, you know, be because of injuries, obviously. If he plays at all, it's going to be a Swiss Army knife defender guy. Go and get me an offensive board. Go and get me a steal. You're going to, if they do some cross, you know, cross matching and, uh, throw, you know, a really tough defensive assignment at our bench. You're going to be the guy that we call on to take that best wing. And we need, you, you know, we need you to hold it down there. And basically that's it. He hit a corner of three every once in a while. His three point percentage was 30%. Uh, and 0.6, uh, three pointers made two two three pointers attempted. So again, you know, not great. He's been an inconsistent shooter from the corner. If he turns into a consistent shooter from the corner, and a really great defender, like th- then you're talking about a roster, not not a roster spot, but you're talking about a a guy that you could actually consider putting into your rotation. Just haven't seen that yet, and didn't really get a clear indication in Vegas that that's that's what they've got. So what I would say about the the two way positions, because we talked about the two way up top with with Musa Diabate getting one of them. I would say both with Black and Diabate, just hold on. Like these are these two way contracts are non guaranteed. You you can waive these things at any time and then give it to somebody else. I think KJ Simpson they're secure because they're going to want to see what they can do with this guy, develop him, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think both of those guys we got to wait and see to see if they're going to hang around on those two way slots. Okay, that's going to do it for this edition of Locked On Hornets. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. Walker Mail will be back uh, with me tomorrow to talk um, all kinds of stuff. We've got. I want to I want to do a little Olympics edition of the show and see you know which Hornets would be the best Olympians. 
Uh, we've got who wore it best. We still have to finish that list. I think we're on number 15, number 14. So we've, we've only got a few numbers to go, but I want to, I want to finish that this summer. Uh, so all kinds of stuff. This, this, the summer of silliness is beginning and we are getting you prepared for uh, the Charlotte Hornets season. Oh, awards. I want to, I want to go through the roster and see who the contenders are for each of the NBA awards. So that's going to be a fun show too. So stick around, stay tuned. Thanks so much for your support. Thanks so much for your listen, man. I know there's a lot of things to listen to right now. Things are getting crazy out there with the Olympics and so on and so forth. And so you've got a lot to listen to, and I'm glad that you make Locked On Hornets. It, it does. It means a lot to me when you tell me that you listen to the show a lot on the YouTube comments and, and it's part of your day. Uh, I don't take that for granted. That's how, you know, I was thinking about that over vacation. Like That is something we, we kind of get into the grind, particularly during the season where we're just doing shows, and and it is special that uh, we, we are a part of your day in some small way. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, like I said, Walker and I will be back tomorrow. Thanks for making us your first listen. Go listen to Locked On Sports today. Go listen to Locked On NBA. They're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff in the offseason as well. Until then, go Hornets. Go America. Let's swarm Charlotte. Bye-bye. 